So without further ado, I'm, I'm going to start with um, one of the recurring themes, actually, which is a fairly simple and possibly directed to you, Brian, first of all, which is about the, some of the definitions of the assess and refuse, the assess and review, um, and some of those related uh, process issues about submitting forms. So perhaps if I could ask you just to give us your definition or BSA definition on those, please. Thank you. Um, right. The assess and review, it, it, to my mind, that is used when you first see a patient and he or she is either not ready um, for treatment or you don't have the capacity at that time to treat them. And you would quite rightly, in those circumstances, send that off for, um, for its processing. If you then subsequently submit and assess and accept assess and fit appliance claim, if um, you put the same date of assessment down on on the subsequent form, the assess and fit appliance claim, then the previous assess and review claim will be withdrawn. Now, obviously, if that happens within the same financial year, then that will be a 21 UA course of treatment. If it straddles financial years, then it's by definition an, uh, it's a 22 UOA course of treatment and obviously has the risk of impacting on your ratios. Um, I also believe that assess and review is the correct form to submit. This isn't in any regulations or legislation, but if you see a patient who um, you feel is a suitable, uh, well, is eligible for NHS treatment, but at the moment isn't suitable because of basic dental health issues, then it's right and proper to send the patient back to their referring practitioner for that to be remedied and then subsequently um, start the treatment and the same rules apply. Um, I don't believe assess and refuse is appropriate for that category of patient. I know some people do. Um, I repeat, it's not in the regs or the legislation. Assess and refuse, for me, should be entirely restricted to those that do not need or are not eligible for NHS-funded orthodontic treatment. So if you think, well, how come there's some IOTM 5s in that? It could be an IOTM 5 where the, the, the sole decision is re uh, removal of an ectopic tooth, for example, in which case they don't have a course of treatment. Um, you could justifiably also submit that as an assess and review if you felt that you might subsequently decide to provide treatment. Um, so assess and refuse, and I think that would help to clarify the issues also for commissioners um, as to the proportion of patients that are being referred that perhaps aren't being inappropriately referred. Now I emphasize that just because a patient assess and refuse, that, that doesn't mean it's an inappropriate referral. So don't misinterpret that comment, please. But um, I think if we restrict the assess and refuse to those that are ineligible for or not, not needing any stage orthodontic treatment through the NHS, and that, that would help matters greatly. Thank you, Brian. There's a related question. For example, a patient seen in primary care that's subsequently referred on to secondary care for orthognathic surgery, whatever it may be, what, what, would, what, would, you put, what would you classify that as based on uh, your understanding? This is where we could ideally do with a separate box and it's assess and transfer, isn't it? Um, I, I personally would put an assess and review in that. I mean, I, I think it's... It's open to debate. I personally put assess and review because it's not obviously unusual. If you refer a patient with class three malocclusion into secondary care, the patient declines or, or in the interim is not sure about an orthognathic approach, it's entirely appropriate for you to receive the patient back, subsequently treat it, a single arch, maxillary arch treatment alone, for example. There will be other instances, but this is one that I get quite a bit. Um, and so assess and review would be, I think, the appropriate not least if we do get enhanced data and it, and it is around the corner where we will have hopefully unique, unique patient identifiers probably through NHS number and we will have complete electronic submission of forms and as part of that every field will be mandatory. I think you're less likely to get flagged as a re assess and refuse if you send that patient into secondary care and then subsequently start treating it. I mean, obviously, it's to be, it, you can easily explain it, but I just think it would be tidier to be an assess and review in that instance, and then subsequently, if the patient comes back and for whatever reason you treat it, you start as, as, as you normally would. Thank you. 
a, a follow-on but slightly broader point about the legality and of carrying out reviews but not submitting a form. And I don't know if any, anyone on the panel has a, has a view on that, but obviously in Colin's situation where he's seeing patients for review and perhaps <laughs> not submitting a claim, the appropriateness of that and the nature of your relationship with that patient, if you haven't formally submitted a PR form, um, I don't know if you can expand on that for us. I think the, the legal situation is unclear, and if you ever approach your own uh, indemnity organisation, you will probably get mixed messages, because I have contacted mine as a, as a practising clinician, just out of interest to hear what they said. Uh, I'm with the DDU, for, for the sake of argument. But um, uh, there is, my understanding is, there's, there's absolutely no requirement to inform the NHS BSA each time you see a patient for review, because this is often the, the, the explanation that's given, or excuse, depending on how you look at it, for multiple assess and reviews, but there, there is no requirement. NHS BSA merely monitors contracts on behalf of the commissioning organisations, and if, if you are reviewing a patient whilst the, the mixed dentition, uh, or deciduous teeth exfoliate or permanent teeth erupt or, or you're waiting for the, the correct time to intervene, then that's good practice. But do you or should you submit an assess and review? I believe not, and I think that's where there was um, perhaps some wasted resource which the transitional commissioning guidance as you've seen today has has addressed and i think that's positive um, it, it shouldn't discourage anyone from reviewing and reviewing at the appropriate time of course many referring practitioners are in a difficult position if they get i know from my own perspective if you get a referral from a performer uh, from uh, a, mul a practice with multiple performers with a high turnover um, it's not like the old days where you had the one-to-one -one relationship where you, you could refer back to the referring practitioner and say please send the, the patient along when the, when the fours come through or, or at the appropriate time, because sadly, often, those relationships aren't there. So I absolutely acknowledge that we do need to see our patients more frequently for review, but I don't believe there's any requirement to submit a form. Yes, there's a requirement to document it properly. I think if you don't keep proper records, then for sure, we're all at risk. Um, but that's a different issue. Thank you. I'm going to kind of carry on in that general area. There's a number of questions that have come through regarding the ratios and particular issues, um, for example, growing practices who are receiving more referrals um, than they can manage proportional to their actual contract volume. And that idea of you know, popular practices are destined to see more referrals and, and how that's going to be managed in the future. I don't know perhaps if that's one more for you, Alice, if you're able to kind of comment on how that situation may be managed into the future um, in terms of practices that are trying to manage their ratios but trying to submit the claims at the right time and uh, also of course related to the situation with the under 10s and some of those interceptive treatments and early referrals uh, for appropriate cases. I think this will always be a, a challenge in an environment where you have a fixed contract value and there's that constant um, balancing requirement to deliver the treatment, um, the, the expected courses of treatment um, for that contract value, but in a situation of growth um, of population and growth of demand where um, those referrals are coming through and there isn't the ability within the commissioning system to respond with the associated growth that might be required to, to manage that activity um, in, the, in the optimal way. Um, I think there is... Um, there, there, there's, a, there's an ongoing challenge there all the while we're not in a position where we can on a yearly basis um, increase contract values in line with, with population growth and, and move, that, move that resource in a timely way. I think the longer term strategy um, which has looked at um, being much clearer about where need is um, and how need can be better aligned to um, service provision um, allows us to look at the, the system more broadly and to see how, the, um, how through perhaps seeking to commission those services more efficiently or release more um, resource in that way. However, I don't, the issue is that that's longer term and doesn't give us a, a particularly um, pragmatic solution uh, for, the, for the shorter term. It is, it is a delicate balancing act. It's something that um, providers do need to flag for their commissioners um, if it's becoming increasingly problematic. Um, but I'm not going to say that the commissioners are going to have an immediate solution <coughs> with a pot of money to address that. I mean, I think the anxiety from providers, and which comes through in the questions, is that uh, 
the, the metrics that have been in place of some of the transitional guidance perhaps unfairly, unfairly penalises some of those providers who maybe don't have contract sizes that are appropriate to their population, um, who are receiving more referrals than that they can manage. And, and, and the, the, it's a common concern which I know Colin has raised and will doubtless come back. And I'm, I'm, I think there is a, a need to see that uh, reviewed and considered in terms of the metrics and KPIs moving forwards. And I think that commitment has been made and has been demonstrated already in the dialogue that's now up and running about um, how those metrics need to be reviewed. Colin's invitation to, to the, to the um, people here today to submit ideas, to, 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 to push um, those conversations forward. Um, but, you know, and, and arguably the fact that, the, um, that Colin has been um, asked to, to do this piece of work shows that actually we really do want a, a, a professional input into what the indicators look like going forward. Sure, thank you. There is a question about the legality of refusing to see patients under the age of 10. Uh, I don't know if anybody could comment on that, uh, whether you can say, I'm not, going to see, I'm not going to see those patients. I'm sure there's a legal view, but as a clinician, I think you are in a very weak place yeah. if you refuse to see under 10-year-olds. Um, I mean, how you then manage the, the assessment claims is another issue, but um, I think we all as clinicians owe it to our patients to see them. I think where the awkward areas arrive is when you start to get inappropriate referrals and, and that's a, a real management problem, um, particularly as I say with itinerant performers that come and go um, and from you know, multiple uh, multi-performer practices, it can be a real, a real challenge. But I, I, I would be, as a clinician, very reluctant to decline to see a patient from a piece of paper. Thank and you. I think there was, there was certainly no reference in the commissioning guide of any intention <coughs> around um, restricting um, access um, uh, to younger children in that way at all. And I think we'd be, um, certainly be concerned locally if that we were starting to hear that and would want to understand what was prompting that change in policy in a local practice. Okay. A, a lot of the questions have been around... Colin, did you want to add something then, by the way? No, no. 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 <laughs> uh, about consistency. Um, well, well, sorry, Guy. I, no, I was only going to say that, that um, Brian, I think, has already answered this, but I've also spoken to Medical Protection Society about, uh, about the position about seeing patients uh, and, and not registering it in some way. And I think the medical protection people were saying, yes, as long as you record it in your clinical notes. But uh, I was just slightly amused by the fact that I wasn't going to get into any trouble for seeing all these patients for free. Sure, sure. It's very reassuring. There's a question about consistency um, in terms of contract extensions and renewals, and, and uh, a comment has been made uh, around about the situation in London about some contracts which have been extended for significantly longer than others. And how do you see that moving forward when you've got contracts that have maybe been extended beyond the kind of short term, one to two years, which are sitting there in, in, in a kind of a substantive way? Um, is th how is that proposed to be managed, and how do we aspire to consistency? from an NHS England point of view. And I, I think this is, this is a real challenge. We came into NHS England with contracts that were expiring, and that was played out across, um, across the country, and there are different pressures in different areas about um, the requirement to bring those, those contracts to the market and the best, and the best way to do that. Um, the fact that the transitional guide is, has been um, moved into now the national guide um, suggests that there is a greater um, national commitment to more consistency. Our trouble comes with the fact that we can have a, a consistent requirement from the centre but there is still, a, um, still local financial reasons and local contracting reasons that might mean that an area team needs to act in a, in a, in a, in a different way. And some of that needs to be balanced off, but I think some of that can come with a greater oversight um, from the centre about understanding those reasons as to perhaps why an area or a sub-region, we're not really area teams anymore, why a, a region or a sub-region is moving forward um, with, different, um, with different contract durations um, and what might be the, the reasons behind that. Um, it, we, we absolutely know the problems that come, particularly when you've got a, a provider who's got a contract in one area and it's being handled in one way and it has another contract in another part of the country where the, the commissioning behaviour is different. There are really um, 
strong aspirations for greater consistency, but this is a, this is a big machine to turn around. This is a big um, shift from what was very localised um, commissioning decision making to being in a position for an organisation to, to, to make those, those um, calls about commissioning decisions when the consequences of those can be very different depending on the market, depending on the quality of provision, depending on the, the, um, the financial position. Um, so although the call for consistency is absolutely there, the, consist the commitment to increased consistency is there, there will always be that requirement for the local conversation to understand what the particular reason behind a direction of travel is. Thank you. John, from your point of view, if one contract has been handled in another way or extended for mm. whatever it may be, and your contract is not being handled in the same way, is, is there any grounds uh, to, to appeal a, a decision or to take that further? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it, it's certainly one of the frustrations because, you know, people come to us for, for advice uh, and it's difficult for us to advise because we don't know the response that we're going to get. Um, the thing that I, you know, I, I, I have a significant degree of, of sympathy with LATs because I believe that a lot of them are under-resourced and certainly under-trained um, and they are handling complex legal issues. They're, they're, they're being asked to interpret uh, regulations which, which lawyers find sometimes difficult to interpret. But, you know, we, we, we're over two years in since, since NHS England was formed and, and simple things like training for, for key personnel in the LAT so that you know that they are going to respond to certain requests in a certain way would I can't see why that would be hugely difficult and would be a great step in the right direction and, and I would have thought again I, I, I don't seek in any way to under uh, underestimate the, the difficulties in um, getting this degree of consistency but one would have thought that if there was a recognition that there were different issues in different areas, that one could say, well, if this is the issue, then that is the response. Mm -hmm. So that one could, should be able to move towards a far greater degree of, uh, of uh, consistency. But all I can say at the moment is that, from my point of view, we are in the same position as we were now, as we were in 2012, that there is no consistency, and it undoubtedly creates uh, significant unfairness to some people who are dealing with certain LATs. Um, and, yeah, that's, the, that's, the, that's absolutely the position. Okay, thank you. And I think, uh, following on from that, th there's two related questions, really. Um, Alice, the comment was that you, you used the phrase brought to market. The follow-on from that from the, from, from the audience is whether effectively then going out to tender or going through a procurement process is, is only a matter of time and is, is effectively a certainty for all PDS contracts at some point in the future. Um, I, I don't know if you can give us any information about that, both if, if it's likely to happen and then what the expectation is to what form that will take and, and perhaps what, what is the likelihood then of, of a rolling contractual relationship with the area teams following that. Um, that's quite a big question, mm. but I don't know if you can give us any kind of thoughts or insights from an NHS England point of view. I think we all struggle with um, whether the possibility of a rolling contract is something that is, um, that is on the cards. And I think the, the reality of what we're in at the moment is almost a rolling situation because of the, the, the issue that we have around um, either... I'll, I'll Determine the phrase bringing the contracts to the market in a second, um, either bringing the contracts to the market or agreeing um, a further period of um, contract tenure with a provider. Um, as we understand it, the contracts are time limited, and as a result, that once the contract reaches the end of that time, there is a requirement for us to test the, the market for um, the provision in that area. It also gives us a chance to look at whether the the configuration of that contract, the amount of activity attached to it, the amount of um, the, the patients and the throughput that it sees, whether that is still in keeping with the, the original um, intention behind the contract. Um, whether bringing to, the con bringing to the market means in every case that a contract will be advertised in the European Journal and um, tended for through an open procurement process um, is the outcome. We have to prepare on that basis um, 
but would understand that there may be circumstances perhaps where there isn't a, there isn't a clear market or there isn't or there are technical reasons why a particular contract couldn't be brought to the market that a commissioner could um, enter into a conversation about why that contract could be extended further the issue comes we have a, a time limit on these contracts that we've pushed and pushed the, the boundaries on essentially the risk is that there will be a challenge to the continuing letting of contracts and extending of contracts and what that would then mean in terms of a, a challenge to, to commissioners in that way. Um, the, I, can't, I don't know where the answer around whether a rolling contract could ever be agreed. I don't know where that will come from unless there's a, a wider discussion around the legislative framework and how that sits with the, the EU procurement laws that we have to, to adhere to. Did, did the Related question is, is, a, is about the, the nature of the procurement process in, in, in itself and there's been a number of examples around the country which have been wildly differing in, in, in style and outcome and whether you aspire to a single uh, NHS England approach to that mm -hmm. and I guess to some extent the degree to which that procurement process may take into account elements such as track record and local knowledge and where the emphasis is going to be placed because uh, I suspect, although it hasn't, hasn't come out in the question, but uh, there will be a lot of uh, people who support the IE or fear that the, the biggest criteria is the UOA value um, and I think they, some reassurance or some insight as to where the emphasis might be placed w w would be helpful at this stage because there's also, UOA value is often the thing that uh, it comes to people's minds. I think, um, and the, the fact that we've got the commissioning guide, the fact that the commissioning guide sets to um, identify what would be a common specification and direction of travel with um, metrics that would um, that would come that would come with it, give us an indication that actually a far more consistent process around a consistent specification is what would be um, what would be the future and um, a, a, as John has alluded to the issue about the fact that there just isn't the commissioning capacity in every part of the country to proceed to, to, to undertake this procurement activity um, at every local at every local um, uh, region um, so I would expect to see a more um, combined um, approach to the commissioning and to see perhaps um, procurements being undertaken across a wider geographical area with a number of contracts within the same um, procurement process, um, therefore um, giving that greater consistency about those contracts that are on offer. Um, your comments in relation to how um, things like local um, uh, local knowledge, local background, local ability to, ability to meet the needs of a local population, Certainly in all the commissioning that I've been involved in, um, whilst, um, whilst in PCTs and with NHS England, that is what sets the, the different the contracts apart and what um, sets the, the scoring apart really and what we're looking for in particular is that particular provider's knowledge of the local area and how they can respond to, that, to the need that's there. Um, that then plays out in the, in, the, in the scoring processes that are in place. And it certainly would not be the case that UOA value is the um, only driver for the decision to award a contract. Um, we use a, a, a quality and um, cost um, benchmarking system within the scoring that certainly is within the contracts now. And we understand that to be um, certainly um, NHS England's direction, direction of travel that allows the most economically advantageous tender to be achieved but that's measured very, very closely against the quality score that that provider, um, that potential bidder would um, have achieved. Okay. Is, is there an appetite to move back towards a standardised UOA value, or do you think those days are long gone now? <coughs> I think you either have a, a, a requirement for the market to respond, yep. and therefore there is a, a price that the market can deliver that contract um, <laughs> to, or a standardised response, a, a standardised UOA value that then isn't in keeping with that. So I would not see that we're going for a standardised value as that um, negates the point of allowing the market to have a part to play in sure. where the contracts sit. Okay. With regard to metrics and quality assurance, a couple of comments have come through around the transitional guidance and uh, about the lack of clinical engagements during the uh, the writing of that document. I think that's, we've probably covered that and we've talked about some of the BOS engagements and so on and so forth, but th th there is th this concern about the degrees of probity and the number of metrics that were being 
asked or being proposed. And reconciling that with the fact that there's already quite a lot of those metrics which are being looked at within the orthodontic assurance framework. And the, the question is really why and, and to what degree is, is there a real problem? Um, when, when does it become metrics for metrics sake? I don't know if anybody could respond to that. I don't know. Um, it might come to you again, I'm afraid, Alice, but yeah. I don't know if you, if you have a view on the number of metrics and, and how we move that forwards away from the, the, the orthodontic assurance framework without overburdening from a bureaucratic point of view. So, and I, so I think there are the different purposes for the different metrics, but I would definitely say we're, we're, we're moving from a position of utilising the transitional guide into a position whereby area teams or local teams, I'm going to get the terminology wrong, local teams are... Um, now working on the enablers that the, the commissioning guide, the national commissioning guide sets out and, and a seek to progressing in that direction. Therefore, the indicators that are within the transitional guide need to be reviewed and reconsidered in, in light of the direction of travel and whether they're the, you know, the appropriate measures going forward and, you know, and lessons. It's, it's never a set in stone um, um, position. There's an opportunity for discussion and review and I think that has that um, invitation to, to review those has already been extended to the profession. We as commissioners certainly cannot cope with vast reams of indicators and, um, um, and sort of the, 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 orthodont uh, the dental assurance framework and the indicators within that give us a really good um, high level position around the performance of, of, of the providers that we've got and then enable us as commissioners to go in and ask the, the further questions. I can't see that we want more and more indicators on top of those. Um, they, they, they start a conversation as opposed to being the be all and end all of that conversation. I definitely don't think this is a conversation about um, coming up with more and more metrics. It's coming up with the best metrics that allow the right um, sort of temperature check of the system to be to be made and the, and the timeliness of how that data is collected and reported. Sure. There's been a related follow-on question about whether the metrics once agreed will be applied uniformly across both primary and secondary care and I guess community services as well mm. and how that get reconciles, reconciled into the future. Um, I don't know if that's being considered or, or if there's a response on that at all. I think all the while that you have the very different methods of collecting the data, having entirely consistent metrics will be tricky. The issue will be around how we ask of the data that we collect for the um, hospital services the same questions as that with, that we ask of the um, um, activity delivered in the primary care setting to enable to give us um, data that's comparable. So at the moment, we haven't got that. And actually, it's about working with our data specialists and our analysts to determine what we want the data to show us um, to enable those right questions to be asked of the acute data so that they then are um, consistent with what's being asked of, of, the, of the primary care data. Okay. It's a question about IOTN3s, and it, it might perhaps be useful, Brian, if you, if you can some, give us just a, a response as to the number of threes that are going through and, and what the impact would be on those being withdrawn in terms of the, uh, how many UOAs that might free up. And then the second related question is, of course, whether that is on the cards or has been discussed or may be discussed in the future and what will be required to make that change, good or bad. Uh, I did show a couple of slides, and I think everyone here and, and the, all members are going to get those slides so you can, you can look at them more closely at, at your leisure. But um, it's remarkably co consistent. Um, the last two financial years... Um, f about 5% were IOTN3 eligible and uh, we had missing IOTNs on another 2.5%. So if we assume, wrongly I know, but if we assume that they're IOTN3s, maximum of about 7.5%, the remainder were all 4s and 5s. Now, I was surprised by that data because I actually think I treat more 3s than that in my practice. However, that's, that's what we get. And there's no evidence that um, there is intentional under, um, underscoring or sorry overscoring or otherwise um, one of the things we look at with the clinical monitoring is the need for treatment as measured by IOTN and the accuracy of the IOTN scoring for, for the cases that we look at and there's a very high standard out there um, nearly all of the patients we, we see the cases we look at are eligible for NHS funding and virtually all of the practitioners uh, we look at are accurately scoring them. 
both in terms of the uh, IOTN, dental health component, aesthetic component, and the, and the qualifier. So there isn't a lot of threes, or there aren't a lot of threes being treated. In terms of withdrawing it, it, it is a discussion that has been had, because when we started at the strategic framework, which um, Alice chaired and, and Colin was a, a major contributor, we were told at the beginning that we had a blank canvas and to come up with what we thought would be a, a better way of spending the quarter of a billion pounds, the 250 million that's spent in England and Wales each year on primary care orthodontic services. And, and there was uh, a view within the group, clinicians and otherwise, that perhaps treatment should be restricted to the fours and the fives. I very much took the view, no, I felt that, uh, I've used the term once already, the law of unintended consequences, but I actually think that that would make clinicians' lives far more difficult. It would serve our population less well. I think it would, um, it would ex increase the um, inequalities that we already see in our society, and I'm sounding a bit like Jeremy Corbyn, but um, <laughs> I, I don't believe that it was the right way to go. But if we find in a few years' time that that 250 million per year hasn't increased and waiting lists are getting longer and patients are getting or not getting treatment at the appropriate time, then difficult decisions may need to be taken. I, I would uh, grieve that day, but it, who knows? All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alice, I don't know. Is there anything to add from... No, it was only that the conversation yeah. was had and it, and it, it didn't permeate later meetings. It was very much, we had a conversation at, at the beginning, there was lots of discussion for and against, and actually we didn't let that topic over overrun the, the, the content of the guide um, because it was felt it wasn't the right time. Um, sure. Or with the, as, as Brian has described, or that it would deliver um, the benefit, or benefits that would outweigh the, 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 the negative consequences. So, so it's it, it isn't, you know, it's not, um, it's not on the table at the moment. It's not in the content of the guide. Um, but as I say, as we don't know what the future holds, but it certainly isn't in, in the near future in terms of the conversations in, with regard to implementation of the guides. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to uh, wash up a few of the, the slightly smaller questions, then, then finish with a, with a really, really important one, if that's OK. Um, the first one for you, Brian, is, is, is around about um, the situation regarding cases over three years old being classified as incomplete by default. That, that's come through from a couple of people. Now, yeah. I don't know if you can clear that up for us. That's not my understanding. Um, I mean, when we did the completion challenges, we chose 36 months as the benchmark where we considered that the, the vast majority of cases uh, are likely to have been completed. Um, the subsequent analysis that I showed, um, those, those two slides with the survival rates, show that, in fact, there are a proportion that go beyond that. But um, that's absolutely right and proper. And we all have cases, particularly the ectopic canines and the functionals followed by FIX, which, which can take that long. Um, it shows, I think, if, if you've got clinical capabilities, that you're treating the more complex cases. Um, so there is absolutely no problem. So um, I have not heard anywhere that that's the case, certainly not from my colleagues in Eastbourne. Sure, thank you. Um, perhaps, perhaps one for you, for you, John, with regard to the judicial view that you mentioned. Is it necessary for each individual case to go through that process or could a single case act as precedent um, if there was commonality? Um, it, it's, it's the latter. If, 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 on a particular point, uh, if, the, if there was a judicial uh, ruling, um, then one could thereafter quite happily point the, the L18 in the, uh, in the direction of that judicial ruling. Um, there, is, there have been no such rulings. As I say, the one case that I, that I alluded to uh, around the, the, the guarantee was settled at the doors of the court. Um, so there was no actual judicial ruling on, on, on that particular issue. Um, it, it is the case that, that uh, as well as the courts, although I'm not sure that the uh, NHS Litigation Authority uh, has the power to, well, certainly doesn't have the power to deal with judicial review, um, but those contracts which are deemed to be health authority contracts, if there's any dispute, um, then the 
in the in the first instance, the uh, the port of call is the NHS litigation authority. Um, I do caution my clients by saying that I do think there's a clue in the title, um, and they are the NHS litigation authority, and therefore those decisions that I have seen, uh, it has to be said where there is any room for uh, finding in favour of the NA in favour of NHS England. That's exactly what they've done. And related very closely is if an area team has made a set of precedent in terms of novating or selling a PDS contract and then resisting when you go to do the same, can that be challenged? Yeah, I mean, you can. You know, I, I seem to be having conversations on, on a regular basis saying, well, that's not the situation with this LAT and that's not the situation with that LAT and that wasn't your situation 12 months ago. And, you know, the, it depends on, on, on how hard nosed the, the person is that I'm speaking to on the other end of the line. But the, the, the common response is, well, we're not that LAT and it's not 12 months ago and this is the situation now. So it's a movable feast. Sure, sure. I'm going to close with, with a really important question, and which is really, there's a number of young specialists who've recently qualified who will be looking for opportunities. and. They're finding those increasing difficult to come by. From an NHS England point of view, or from a procurement point of view, are individuals like that on the agenda, and what are they supposed to do in terms of having the same kind of career directory as some of their uh, older colleagues? I don't know if that's been discussed, or Alice. I don't know if it's something considered from your point of view, but I know there's considerable anxiety amongst the, uh, the, the younger elements of the workforce about what the future might hold for them. And this is the particular challenge that we have, that we have a cohort of contracts for which decisions about their, their future need to be decided, um, particularly because the consequence of the disruption to those contracts on patient treatment, the cost of the transfer of those um, uh, of the activity potentially to new providers within the, the, the current configuration of the, the UOA on assignment of case start means that it makes it a very complex um, area in which, to, in which to tender contracts. But we have to couple that with a balance that the market shouldn't be closed um, and that there should be um, opportunities for, um, for new entrants to be able to bid for contracts. Um, we've heard the complexities around the sale of contracts, which also creates some barriers as well to, 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 to younger um, orthodontists um, get it, getting a contract. Um, the market isn't closed. There are examples, and particularly where um, contracts are returned to NHS England or where UOAs are, are reconfigured in different ways when, when contracts have been let, and this, and, and this is happening up, up and down the country, but they are currently few and far between. Um, but we would say there is an intention that this, is, that, that this, shouldn't, this isn't a closed market. There should be a way to, to, to more um, effectively bring, bring, bring the contracts um, that that should be brought to the market um, in, a, in, a, in a timely way and um, enable um, new entrants to bid alongside um, any other interested party. But do you think it's realistic for a young graduate who doesn't have infrastructure, track record or experience to be competitive in, in, in a procurement process? Is there not a converse view that having contracts that can be more easily innovative and more stable is more likely to allow opportunities for those types of individuals who can secure funding from the bank and enter into a, almost a mentoring type transition from retiring uh, elderly elder colleagues um, as opposed to a much more uh, aggressive procurement process which is going to favour much larger corporate business orientated organisations. And I think this is the juncture we find ourselves at again and again because the requirement when we're dealing with a time limited contract requires us to have that, that market view and yet when you look at how the contracts are delivered, how the activity is, how the experience and infrastructure um, all come together, it doesn't lend itself to that solution um, as we move forward. And I, until there is some either review of how it um, fits in in terms of the European procurement laws or how it ties in with the, old, the legislative review around the, the regulatory frameworks of these contracts, I can't see how we're going to reconcile that position in a way that um, meets the needs of everyone. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to draw the panel to a close because I'm aware that we've overrun slightly, but there's been so many questions. As I say, I will forward those on um, for response and we will make the content available via the VOS website. So, Without further ado, thanks to Alice, to John, to Brian, and to Colin, and thank you all for coming along. Enjoy the rest of your week.